Uh, hello and welcome to another cover seminar. I think this will be the last one of this academic year. Um, and um, to have a, a fittingly excellent ending, um, he, today we are joined by Tong Yong Wu, who is going to uh, talk with us about her work on AI and data labor and expanding who's included in in that research, which sounds super interesting and super short intro. I'm just gonna hand it over to you. All right, sorry about that. Hey. I, uh, okay, yeah, I'm so sorry about that. Okay. Everybody can see that? Okay, cool. Uh, I mean, let me apologize one more time. I mean, that, that that's never happened before, but uh, I don't know what, what's good really going on, but thank you again for inviting me. And uh, let me introduce myself one more time very briefly. So I'm um, Koi Wu. <laughs> it's pronounced absolutely correctly. And uh, I'm a, a system professor at uh, Zhejiang University. So uh, today I will be presenting my work, which I just uh, titled that as um, expanding the scope of digital labor research. So before I'm going to detail about my research, I want to first give you a, a, an overview uh, in terms of like my general research direction. It can be directed into three directions. So the first direction concentrate on the AI data annotators as how as the low status the digital labor group. So this is actually an ongoing research. I use this project to explore basically the 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 data annotator in the AI industry and also like the Chinese government's role in reintermediating the AI data work into the local society. But I won't talk about that topic today, but I'm happy to share if somebody wants to uh, uh, talk, discuss about that. But the first part of my today's talk will uh, concentrate on the related uh, uh, topic in the data annotator industry. It will be on how the annotation work uh, play an important role in breaching the gap between the human value and the machine recognition. And the second direction of my own research is about the software developer, uh, which has the highly skilled uh, digital labor group. So a series of my publication actually, uh, including my forthcoming book are associated with this topic. So majorly, I used uh, uh, 30 months of ethnographic work in a Silicon Valley company to reflect on how the US tech industry trying to develop strategies in managing engineer to squeeze out uh, uh, creativity. And uh, if time allowed, I will talk about this project briefly in today's talk. And the third direction is actually for my future research. So for my re for, uh, future research, I'm thinking about to show more about the inherent connection between the highly skilled and the low status, low status digital labor group by using the artificial uh, intelligence industry as the case study. So let me start by talking about the first project. It's titled uh, Bridging the Human AI Gap at Whose Cost? skill and organizational alignment in the data uh, annotation work. So to start my presentation, I will briefly introduce a key issue that uh, is a current uh, major focus in the field of uh, AI. The issue is known as the alignment problem. So the essence of the alignment problem can be defined as that the human society increasingly relies on the AI to make decisions and to take action on our behalf. So for example, uh, in the autonomous driving field, driverless car can replace human to make decisions like whether to move forward or break. In order to make such decision, the AI model firstly have to train to align with the human world uh, recognition, such as recognizing the road, obstacle, uh, the road obstacles or like uh, other vehicles or like uh, traffic lights. And uh, uh, or let's take the most famous the AI model ChatGPT, for example. So one challenge that ChatGPT face right now is to close the gap between the AI understanding of the human society and the human's own understanding of, of our society and the norm and the value. So to close the gap then become a very critical question that the computer scientists are trying to address. That is how can we secure ensure that the AI model 
accurately capture the uh, the best human value rather than magnify the worst? This is the question called the alignment problem. And it is first proposed by Brian Christian, who is a, a researcher trained in uh, computer science. But for today's talk, I'm trying to provide some sociological reflection behind this alignment problem. So first, I want to uh, emphasize that, that behind this alignment problem, there is actually a lies an important labor problem. So the essence of the alignment is feeding the machine a training data set. And the task of adjusting this data set to align with the human thought and norms falls on the shoulders of the data annotator. And the second point that uh, I want to discuss is that, well, the mainstream researcher tries to portray the data annotator a labor as a very low skilled. I want to show that actually data annotator uh, actually involved a variety of the labor skill. And those skill are hidden or undervalued largely due to the, the, the capital interests. So uh, based on the above the uh, consideration, I proposed the following research question. First, how are alignment strategy formulated during the AI development? Second, how does the AI achieve alignment through the data annotation process? And third, how is the data annotation labor organized and controlled in the practice of the alignment? And what are the skills required for the data annotation labor and how are those skills are developed? Uh, so to discuss those issues, it's essential to engage with the literature on the human-machine uh, relationship. There are actually two camps in the debate. So there is one camp called the technological discontinuity camp. It suggests that new computing technology like uh, machine learning often create a historical turning point. And after those tenure points, the machine can basically replace the many human jobs. And uh, on the contrary, uh, a scholar in the technological continuity camp emphasized that no matter how innovative the computer te technology becomes, it still inherent have uh, like uh, limitations. And those technological limitations required actually significant uh, uh, human intervention. So I believe that the technology continuum camp uh, more persuasive. Uh, even so, the theoretical approach still have room to improve. So scholar in this camp often focus on the emergence of the new labor group to address the technological limitation. Uh, however, what I want to emphasize is that the rapid development of the modern computer technology often does not lead to the emergence of the, the, the new labor group. Instead, it's forced the existing labor group continues to recognize, uh, to reorganize their skills. So my research basically trying to explore how the same labor group continuously adapt their uh, skills to to adjust uh, to adapt to the technological change so in order to answer that i also in, have to bring into the the, the labor skill literature so to highlight the skill dimension of the human machine uh, relation so my theoretical foundation for discussing skill is rooted into the of course marxist uh, tradition so this tradition primarily views the relationship between the machine the capital the labor skill from the perspective of the conflict and the confrontation Secondly, I also want to incorporate a, a, a constructive perspective to emphasize on the relativity and uncertainty inherent into skill. So I believe that uh, uh, highlighting the relativityness and the constructiveness will be particularly useful for understanding the skill in the AI era. But due to the time limits, I won't elaborate on that, but I'm happy to talk more, I mean, if we have time for the Q&A. And finally, I try to adopt uh, and redefine Ursula Hughes' upskill and downskill structure. So Hughes originally introduced this concept that expressed that the, the emergency of the new technologies all, always like a close tie to the upskilling of the knowledge class, which will lead to the downskilling of the other uh, or lower status, status labor group. But Beyond his her, her own narrative, I find that this framework also implies that a skill change should be not perceived as a linear process, but as a cycle to continuous upskilling and downskilling. And I found this framework works really well to capture the human labor skill change that can complement the, the AI limitation. 
So my research is actually conducted by a research team. Uh, it consists of myself and also Professor Bing Qingxia from the East China Normal University and one AI uh, practitioner who is currently working in the AI department of a major Chinese tech company. But due to the sensitivity of her company, the research is holding the anonymous status for now. And the final researcher is Riri Liu. She's a doctor student from my department at uh, Zhejiang University. So this study is a multi-sided ethnographic uh, research work. So the research work spans five years from July 2019 to December 2023. So we conducted research at nine different field sets. In addition to those field trips, uh, we also conducted 192 summit structured interview. And uh, today's presentation is actually going to focus on the data from five key field sets. The first set is the independent, it's one uh, independent annotation factory F in Chongqing. And it's also include two annotation startups, K and Z. And uh, the fourth set is a BTEX outsourced annotation base. And finally, the final set is the XTEX uh, in-house annotation uh, department. Uh, so to better discuss the empirical case, I want to first briefly talk about the two important stages of AI development and it, uh, and their uh, uh, related data annotation uh, industry development. So the first the major breakthrough in AI technology was primarily in the field of computer vision. So in 2012, uh, uh, a research team at the University of Toronto significantly reduced the error rate in computer vision recognition by using the convolutional net neural network, CNN. And uh, simply put, so this advanced basically allowed the computer to more accurately distinguish between image, or let's see, to dis differentiating from a cat to dogs. So from tw uh, 2012 to 2016, CNN technology went through a practical implication, especially in the field of the autonomous the driving field. And uh, vision AI data annotation primarily aimed at aligning the computer vision with the human physical world, such as identify the vehicles or like the obstacles. So the China's development of the vision AI annotation can be divided into two uh, stages. So from 2016 to 2018, it's experienced the ramp up stage. And from 2018 to now, the vision AI moved to, to the mature stage. And the second major uh, uh, technological uh, breakthrough in AI actually focused on the neural language processing, NLP. And the key event is OpenAI's introduction of the large language model ChatGPT in 2020. So with the exposure of the large language models, the data annotation industry in this field also rapidly developed. So the LLM data annotation primarily aimed to align the computer language with the human subjective words and the values. And China's LLM data annotation closely followed the, the global trend and begins in 2022. Now it's in the ramp up stage. So now let me discuss about the, the, the vision AI first. Uh, so as previously mentioned, so in China, uh, the application of the vision AI uh, annotation is already entered into the mature stage, and it's also the most uh, competitive stage. So as the vision AI annotation uh, 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 moves to the mature stage, they, it's actually uh, uh, experienced a, a very significant reshuffling. So in the process, nearly 60, like, 50% of the established uh, annotation companies are eliminated. Instead, it's replaced by what they call the new forces, the annotation companies. And uh, those new companies have a very strong startup uh, nature, which can be reflected in their obsession with revolutionizing the annotating uh, uh, technology to meet the venture capital's demands. So their uh, technology revolution is majorly reflected as the automation at the platform. <laughs> so uh, let me start by the aut automation. So currently all the major annotation startups are trying to automate the pre, uh, 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 pre nomination 
So for example, Ms. Huang from the company K explained that uh, the machine uh, pre-automation is now very accurate. So once the platform receives the image, it can just automatically uh, uh, to, to, to label them and directly automate uh, the, the people, the vehicle and uh, the obstacles. So from the, actually the capitalist uh, perspective, the pre-automation largely reduced the skill requirement for the automators. For example, Ms. He from company B mentioned that uh, autonomous driving office involved a, a, a type of a 3D cloud automation. It at least uh, takes two or three months of training to master those 3D uh, annotation rules. But with the automation process, this training time is completely eliminated. So lower the skill requirement also reduce the, the educational requirement for workers. So as showing in the, the, the following quote, actually a general manager of uh, the B base explained that the automation allows the company to lower the education requirement from a college degree to a vocational degree. But in, react, uh, in reality, if you ask the workers, you will find out due to the insignificant uh, accuracy of the pre-automation, workers actually spend more effort adjusting the pre-automation than they would uh, autonomating uh, uh, from the scratch. Uh, so that's basically for the automation. And now I'm moving on to talk about the, 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 the platformization. So, uh, so actually, most of the startups trying to improve their uh, platform technology. Uh, for example, two of the companies that we investigated trying to optimize their platform data tracking uh, settings and to intentionally intentionally conceal all the suppliers' information and the data supply chain. That means that. As the data demander, the large tech company do not even know which tier of the supplier eventually uh, annotated their data. So um, this setup, actually what I want to show is largely extends the data uh, annotation chain. For instance, for instance, Ms. Wang from company B explained that annotation may seem like a, a single job, but it's actually involved a lot of linkage broker, Chuan Chuan. So the extended chain actually serves uh, for the capital interest and also for the government interest as it allows the third and fourth tier of city to participate into the AI production. For example, Mr. Bay from company F said, so the third and fourth tier cities are eager to get involved. Those lower tier cities cannot afford to play with the algorithm uh, development. So the data annotation business could be very appealing if it sinks to the lower tier cities. The final thing that I want to talk about the, 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 the mature stage of the AI, uh, vision AI annotation is that the downward alignment brings the continuing decline in the wage rate. So before moving into the mature stage, the wage for annotator is, can reach to uh, 10,000 uh, RMB in 2016. But after 2020, uh, with the automation and the plan for uh, uh, improvement, the wage decreased to around uh, 2,000 yuan and, uh, per month. Also, uh, in relation related, so the work condition become a uh, very uh, worsen as well. So the code here basically uh reflect one supervisor from the B tech shared that there is essentially no difference between the worker sit work situation at the annotation base and the Foxconn. And you can see the photo, the bottom photo actually that's taken from um, the annotator's uh dorm. Uh, it's uh, quite uh horrible. And uh, so after talking about the, 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 the significant reduction of the skill for the uh, vision annotation, I want to move to the large language model annotation and its skill requirements. So the purpose for the LLM uh, uh, annotation can be divided into, at least I think, for two directions. The first direction is to better uh, align the model with the human thinking. It's quite uh, straightforward. Uh, what's really interesting is the second direction is to unlocking the model's potential and training it to become an expert in various uh, subfield. So according to our uh, field notes, 
Company X primarily unlocks its large language model into three directions. So the first is the, to train a universally knowledgeable AI. So annotators in this field are tasked with creating prompts and answers spanning from multiple fields, such as math or history or popular culture. And the second concentrate on the role playing, uh, training the AI to become a role playing AI expert. So the annotators in these directions are responsible for crafting dialogues that simulate tones of a certain figures, let's say Elon Musk or like Mark Zuckerberg or Brad Pitt. So the third direction concentrate on training the a uh, 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 personalized uh, AI companion. So annotators need to write sample uh, uh, segments to fit into the model and train it visibility of a providing uh, advice and the companionship to the users. And uh, uh, based on that uh, understanding, I also want to talk about the three important features of the LLM uh, annotation. So first, uh, like the maturity of the vision AI annotation, the large language model has a highly uh, uh, empirical nature. So for example, Mr. Xia from annotation company F mentioned that so for the algorithm de department, each batch of the data comes with a hypothesis that must be tested. They need you to annotate and test it. However, this process is really growing, uh, grueling for us as they require countless uh, back and forth and reworks. So manager says narrative implies that empirical na uh, experimental nature actually lead to a very frequent uh, communication between the algorithm department and the annotation base. And the second feature of the large language model uh, annotation is its inherently subjectivity. So for example, one annotation task at the company X is to train a model to become a role-playing expert and to sound more like a particular characters. Uh, however, this annotation process is very subjective as explained by one of the team leader from company F. So let's see. Uh, we're trying to train a model to sound more like you, but you cannot list the explicit rule to, de uh, to determine if the conversation follow Yu's style or Shenteng's style. So both Yu and Shenteng are among the most recognizable Chinese comedy uh, uh, actors. And as the team leader explained, it's very subjective uh, uh, judgment on whether the conversation can uh, follow a more closely to Yu or Shenteng's comedian uh, style. So it's very difficult to regulate such uh, judgment actually by rules. And uh, the third character that I want to emphasize is that uh, the large language model um, actually require very high quality annotated data. For example, the head of the algorithm department at uh, company X mentioned uh, in the internal lecture that uh, so they, uh, he mentioned that we have to uh, have experiment by replacing 5,000 average data with 1,000 high quality data and all the models uh, uh, performance metrics just uh, improved uh, significantly. So those are the three features I want to emphasize the first. So based on those new features, we found out that the large language model annotation organizational uh, structure and labor control have undergone a dramatic change in comparison to the vision annotation. So first, uh, the organization of the, the, the large language model annotation is centered around the issue of the power. This character is closely related to the, the highly subjective nature of the, the, the large language model. So for instance, Ms. Q, a product manager in the data department of company O is saying that, so the LLM's response are essentially about which one you perform. So who did that, those standards, the product manager. Then the product manager's values become the standard. You will, uh, you can even say the model essentially just the reflect the value of the product, uh, product team. So we can tell that. So in absence of the absolute standards, it's the party who hold the absolute power eventually shape the value of the, the, the model. 
So according to our uh, uh, field observation at Company X, we found out that the most powerful powerful party is the department that they call the alignment department. So uh, to strengthen the department's power, the annotation supply chain actually need to be shortened. For example, at the company X, after the company decided to fully switch its focus to the large language, uh, large language uh, model development, the first thing the company did was it established the alignment department in the headquarters. So this department includes 20 employees knowing as the alignment strategy manager and 30 hired experts from various fields, refers as the annotation experts. They then reorganize one of their previous self-owned annotation base which consists of 300 to 400 people. It used to engage into the autonomous the driving uh, annotation, but now the entire base has been trans transitioned to the large language model annotation. Therefore, the, the chain actually has been shortened to a binary structure consisting of only the core alignment department and the periphery self-owned annotation base. So with this core and the periphery binary structure, the task of the core annotation department is to make standards through a, 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 an organizational process, a process what they call the four-party alignment meeting. For example, there is one task for X development of one uh, AI companion expert is to generate a conversation on the back to the hometown topic. So the core alignment department expert needs to draft a 10 to 20 rounds of the dialogue sample. Uh, so actually from the table on the right, we can see that the creative and the psychological expert provide input on how to revise those samples during the what they call the four party alignment meeting. And after the meeting, uh, the writing sample and the annotation guidelines are fixed and passed to the base, the annotation base. And the periphery annotation base is then tasked with provide uh, 30 headcounts, uh, 30 workers to create uh, 200 rounds of dialogue over three days based on those samples and rules. There's a problem that I want to emphasize is that uh, under this core and periphery structure, there is a significant wage disparity between the core department, the alignment department, and those in the periphery uh, annotation base. So at, for company X, uh, the core department uh, uh, data annotation experts are paid annual salary ranging from uh, two, uh, 200,000 to 300,000 yuan. In contrast, in contrast, the periphery based annotators are paid monthly wage, the wage range, uh, range between uh, uh, 3,500 to 600 yuan per month. The question then becomes, does that mean that the skills of the core department uh, uh, employee are much higher than those workers in the periphery annotation base? So when we discussed this with the workers in the periphery annotation base, we found that many workers and the base manager disagree with this view. For example, there is a manager at another self-owned uh, base of company T mentioned that she believes that her annotation workers uh, work is like more challenging than the alignment department's experts. So in her own words, uh, experts only need to provide simple questions and answers. However, her workers need to create multiple types of uh, answers and need to determine the best answer and face much uh, greater time pressure. So in a situation where it's difficult to clearly define which parties of skill are higher, we found out that the large companies like uh, Company X use three strategies to elevate the expert skill and devalue the annotation worker skill. One strategy is to control the authority to establish the annotation rules through the four-party uh, alignment meeting, just like what I mentioned before. And another strategy is to join the educational boundary. So for, for example, the company acts requirement for the annotation experts explicitly uh, obviously require the, the, the bachelor degree or higher. And the final boundary, actually, it's the one we find out the most important one is that they draw the moral boundaries. So the core department attribute the moral significance to the work of their data experts. 
So for example, W, the overall head of the alignment department at Company X explained that, so we now have a 18 years old uh, child. I mean, he means the, the model. So before 18, it grew wildly, learning many things about how to eat and speak. After 18, we need to decide what kind of textbook to use to turn them into experts. We are like the Ministry of Education that compels textbook. Later, we took another occasion to discuss uh, this metaphor with W again, and he further uh, uh, likened the annotators in the base as the, the, the AI teachers. And he emphasized that the teachers must follow the Ministry of Education's guidance, means need to follow the alignment department guidance. So the final thing that I want to emphasize is that um, the annotation worker skill not only being developed, but also being forced to continue and uh, upgrade it during the ramp up stage. So uh, as the premise, uh, parameters of the large models keep expanding, those models are become increasingly uh, intelligent. So for example, during our field work, we document an incident uh, last November, I mean, November, 2023. Uh, so when the company acts, large lang uh, language models uh, parameters increased from uh, 100 billion to 200 billion, the model suddenly became generating dialogues that the uh, uh, annotator, annotation expert rated as good quality. So that means the company no longer need the annotation workers to produce good quality dialogues, but instead they require them to elevate the dialogue quality to excellent level. So faced with this issue, the company acts uh, uh, self-owned base have to organize emergency training to produce uh, the, the excellent level dialogues. And uh, the, okay. So the, the final thing I want to talk about is uh, as the large uh, model parameter increase, their self-learning ability also become highly uncontrollable. So when the parameter reach to certain scale, the machine basically can cook, uh, quickly master a domain. So once the domain is mastered by the model, it's no longer required uh, annotation workers in that domain. So that will force the workers to uh, shift uh, to another domain. So that's basically uh, pose another for the workers to upgrade their skills. So, uh, in terms of uh, conclusion, I actually don't have any settled conclusion for this project, as this is actually in the process of uh, writing. But I do have some uh, uh, thoughts that I want to share. So first, I want to try to use this study to show that the data annotation as a crucial labor that used to fill the gap uh, between the human and the machine. And I also want to show that the cost of the rise and the fall of those uh, annotation skills is shouldered actually by the annotators. And finally, I aim to illustrate uh, how the labor organization and control continually to adjust uh, in response to their skill change. And uh, those adjustments ensure to serve the capitalist interests actually more, if, more efficiently and concentrate on to seeking to obscure uh, and develop the, the labor skill. And if there is time, I would really love to share the second part of my 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 my, my research. It's about the do I still got some time? Maybe 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, I guess if you'd like, yeah. Oh, okay. Because like um, so this is actually basic based on my book. The the reason why I'm very exciting because the book is like uh almost released uh, actually in the, this month, by the end of this month. It's uh, actually under production with the uh, Temple University Press. So the title of the book, also the the the, the project is Play to Submission, uh, capital, uh, Gaming Capitalism in the Tech Firm. So, um, so for the previous part of the presentation, I actually start directly by introducing the, the, the AI technology and uh, the, the related issue about alignment. But for this part, I want to take a step back and talk about the general trend of the informational capitalism. And there are two trends that I want to talk about. So the first trend is that the development of the informational capitalism lead to the further, uh, what we call the polarization between the mental and the manual labor. 
So on the one hand, the development of the new technology like uh, platform technology allows the corporation to lower the labor cost of the lower status worker, just like the data annotators. But on the other hand, that's what I pay attention for this project. The capitalists uh, actually increased demand for inventing new technologies. This largely enhanced the labor value of the engineering and the programming labor. So the second feature that I want to talk about for the informational capitalism is that the technological uh, iteration is very fast uh, nowadays. So Gina Neff, the one of the scholars, described this as the permanently beta asset in the tech industry. So to some extent, the fast iteration is determined by the, the nature of the software driving products. As most of the products are characterized by the endless the series of patches, updates, and the uh, pivots. So what I want to uh, point out is that there is a paradox embedded into the two major trends of the tech industry. So on the one hand, the tech industry has heavy reliance on the technological innovation gave engineers a pre privileged pre uh, position in the uh, labor market and more bargaining power. But on the other hand, the tech pursuit of the permanent beta ethic actually requires engineers to submit to a very highly intensive work life. For example, when the tech company needs to pivot products, engineers can easily de devote like 70 to 100 working hours a week to meet the deadline. Then the question, the paradox lead to the question is like, why the seemingly powerful uh, workers uh, or the work group submit to such an intense production, uh, production mode? So to understand that question, I concentrate my study, this study in the US tech industry. So at the first glance of the, the, the US tech industry, they solved the paradox in a very brutal way. It's solved by aggressively, aggressively recruiting new grads graduate students. So according to the American Community Survey, the average age of the high-tech workers is 35. It's eight years younger than the average American workers. And those young workers actually are the ideal employee for the work environment. They are usually more energetic and creative than a senior engineer. And they have more actually leisure time and uh, less uh, familial responsibility. But the problem is that although the tech firm can uh, lower the labor cost by hiring those uh, fresh graduates, but they face the challenge to retaining and controlling those young engineers. Uh, it's very challenging for them, especially those young engineers usually are very uh, 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 passionate about technological innovation. However, once they find out their company actually prioritizes business profit over the uh, uh, technological innovation, the resentment level of those young workers can raise enormously. So the question then becomes how the tech companies solve, solve those questions. If we look very closely at those labor group, uh, we will find out those engineers have a very uh, special type of labor subjectivity. The majority of the Silicon Valley engineers were born between 1979 and the 2000. This is also the time when the video game industry be began to boom. So those young engineers are actually called the gamer uh, generation by some scholars. So long time game planning, playing have endowed uh, those engineers with a very unique subjectivity, what I call the gamer subjectivity. And the subjectivity make the engineer very sensitive to the game setting and very likely to become addicted to the game. So targeting at those uh, subjectivity, the tech industry just uh, start to import the gaming techniques to the engineer workplace. So to in order to understand how those games are designed and organized, uh, this study draws on actually the labor game literature. So labor game is a very long tradition started by Michael Borowitz's work, very briefly about Borowitz's study. So by conducting the, the, the ethnographic work in a factory in Chicago, Borowitz found out making out game or used on the shop floor to motivate competition between workers in a pizza system to, to drive high level of the production. However, in this book, book project, I try to identify a series of issues embedded into the classic labor game study and trying to make several updates. So first, uh, this study trying to show that one single labor game may not satisfy the organizational goal of motivating uh, workers throughout uh, their work process. And secondly, this study also wants to offer an update to the discussion of labor uh, subjectivity. 
So worker subjectivity is actually the key uh, elements of Bar Michael Borowitz's uh, labor theory. However, later labor uh, labor scholars, especially the feminist labor scholars, prom prominentized uh, Borowitz's class first approach to understand workers subjectivity. So my study followed the feminist approach. I also try to present a more complex nature of labor subjectivity and emphasis on the video game consumption and how that can shape engineers, gamers' subjectivity. And the, finally, this study trying to bridge the gamification analysis and the labor game uh, analysis. So gamification research is an interdisciplinary field uh, uh, emerged, I believe, after 2010. So gamification refers to the adaption, application of the gaming elements or technology uh, to the non-gaming context, including like work, education, and the military. And uh, apparently there is at least the three key features of the gamification analysis. So the first is really emphasized on document uh, various the gaming technologies like points or badges. And second, gamification analysis emphasizes more on the systematic top-down setup of the gaming environment. And the third feature for the gamification study emphasized on the discipline and manipulate individual behavior. Uh, through setup of the game element rather than the collective uh, behavior. So my study trying to suggest that incorporating the gamification analysis into analysis of uh, labor games actually can enrich the study of labor game. For example, since the labor game are organized the bottom up, there is a focus on the role of the middle level management. But uh, the in contrast, uh, the top down nature of the gamification makes it really concentrated on the role of the senior manager. So combine those two approaches actually can remind us that in different, uh, at least uh, there are different managers role in organizing like games. So my research take place in American high tech corporation that I call Huli. Huli is one of the top 20 multinational corporation in the US. So I collect data through participant observation and semi-structured interview. So for participant observation, um, uh, I actually conduct a 13 months of uh, observation at a org that I call Wallet Org. So the top picture actually shows the one team area where I hang out almost uh, every day during the 13 months. In addition, I also interviewed uh, 66 uh, uh, informants. Uh, just very briefly about uh, the gamers and the game. So uh, let me start by talking about the, 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 the gamers. So among all my interviewees, there are 29 gamers and 37 uh, non-gamers. So as you can see from the top table, uh, one thing you need to notice is that a gamer is actually a self-label identity. So although the non-gamers do not self-identify as gamer, but they still spend very long time playing video games. And uh, through coding the interview, uh, I found out there are at least uh, uh, several important themes in defending the gamer subjectivity, uh, subjectivity, such as those gamers are uh, very likely to retreat to the gaming world to make social bonding. And they usually possess very strong competitive, uh, uh, competitive spirit. And it's very easy for them to mobilize uh, crisis the mentality. And uh, due to the time limit, I won't present the codes. And uh, I want to talk about the games. So uh, I find out Huli is filled with more than 50 type of games, which I call the field of game. So as you can see from the table, actually the bottom table, I have also categorized those games into four major groups, which include the simulation games, racing game, cross sourcing game, and pranking game. And uh, I'm going to just uh, talk maybe a little bit about just the uh, one game. Uh, so it's the cross-sourcing game. So the the one cross-sourcing game that uh, I am going to talk about is called the badge collection game. So the badge collection is embedded into engineers' volunteer maintain, maintenance uh, work. So one thing we should notice about the software, uh, software development is that the development teams are encouraged to only deploy a minimal viable product, MVP, instead of uh, creating a perfect end product which means that uh, the development team, uh, they own, when they launch their MAPs, they actually left uh, a lot of a gig uh, task that are solved in the system. So the gig tasks are the tasks uh, that are less urgent and uh, scattered around the company waiting to solve in the future. 
So solving the gig work is not the engineer's required uh, responsibility, but belongs to the volunteering work. So to motivating the engineer to contribute actual effort to the gig work, uh, the wholly gamify this work and transform it into a, a badge collection game. So the badges actually are the, the, the pictures modeled after virtual gaming badges, just like um, the picture I show here. So uh, each badge represents a type of task. Whenever the engineer fulfills the task, they are rewarded with a virtual badge. So there are diverse type of badges. Some involve helping the company test the products. Others involve helping the company to debug. So there are actually more than thousand types of badges the workers can collect. And all badges are visually displayed on engineers' personal website, just like that. And uh, those badges uh, uh, di displayed apparently very similar to the badge displayed in the video games. And uh, one thing that I want to point it out is that Huli actually adopted uh, very strictly the gamification technology to set up the batch collection game. And the many study trying to show how gamification as a very powerful behavior manipulation technology. However, my empirical case showed that there are at least the sweet weakness of the gamification setup. First, the, the gamification rules are very mechanical and rigid. For example, there is a one badge called the customer connection badge. So the, the requirement is um, how, on how to earn the badge is very strict. So engineer must participate into the workshop and receive the one phone call from the customer team and solve the bug and to get the badge. Uh, and second, oh, sorry. And second, uh, directly by the gamification logic, the game is designed in a very top-down uh, uh, manner. So the batch connection platform is constructed at the corporate level. Middle-level managers and workers actually have very minimal wiggle room to change the game rules. And the third weakness is that the gamification designs runs counter to the gamer's subjectivity. So the rigid gamification designs actually make the engineer realize that uh, it's just a really phony mimic of their video game playing. What I want to show is that uh, because of they have such a rich gaming experience, it's easier even for them to see how phony the setup it is. So the basically the badge collection game is very difficult to mobilize engineers, uh, gamer subjectivity. As a result, the engineer gen generally just the indifferent towards to the collection game. They develop the three uh, strategy for the game, the practical ones, the performance one, and the perfunctional approach. So I just uh, talk uh, one very interesting is the practice tacit. Uh, the engineer adopt. Basically, what they do is that uh, they just uh, invest the minimum collecting time for the maximum rewards. So to do this, engineers always browse the list of the collectible badges and select those are the easiest uh, to unlock. And engineers, when we chat, they tell me like their experience, the easiest uh, to unlock badge are actually the quiz-based one or the event-based event one because the time needed for uh, unlock those badges are very predictable, easy to calculate, and usually to cost uh, fewer than two hours. So apparently this is a very, uh, 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 it's such a failed uh, gamification setup. But if you put that into comparison, you will see some other gamification setup actually works. This is what I called also related to the maintenance work is the tickets game. So just like the batch collection game, the tickets game is also integrated into the engineer's maintenance work. However, it's embedded into the, it's not in the volunteer work, but the routine maintenance activity. Basically what happened is like whenever the client encounters an error when using the development team software, uh, they will shoot, uh, send the tickets to the development team and the on-call engineer from the team will receive the tickets and need to solve the error. And there are two uh, key issues actually to consider. The first is that the managers do not want to over accumulate the tickets because the higher number of the tickets will uh, indicate the more unresolved issue in the system and thus to increase the system's uh, uh, vulnerability. And also the second point is that the backlog of the a lot of unsolved tickets tend to cause the resentment from the engineer. The reason is that a large of a, a large number of tickets actually 
shows that the company just prioritized to develop the what, what I just mentioned, the minimum viable products, MVPs, over optimized the existing products. This actually lead to a lot of resentment from the engineer. So to deal with those issues, the engineer, the, 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 the company developed the, the game, they call the ticket game. Namely, it's involved adding the leaderboard on the ticket metric page. So one thing you should notice is that the leaderboard does not list the exact number of the unsolved tickets for each developed team. Instead, it's just the rank the team based on the numbers of the unresolved tickets, with the team have the fewer unresolved tickets staying at the top of the position. So on the one hand, the relative ranking system introduced the element of uncertainty. And this uncertainty actually provide engineers with greater autonomy in decision making, like they can decide how they do to enhance the ranking. And on the other hand, this set of also forced a sense of a competition between different teams. Essentially, each team's goal is just to outperform the others by solving like more tickets, thereby improving their rankings on the, the, the leaderboard. So uh, apparently the this game uh, very successful. They successfully mobilized engineers' gamer subjectivity. So uh, uh, the engineers uh, uh, actually start to join on a lot of uh, their own play video game playing strategies and uh, to invest them into the tickets game in order to boost their team's ranking. So one popular game strategy used by the engineer is called the tickets marathon. It means whenever the engineer saw the tickets run, uh, ranking, their team's uh, ranking dropped uh, too rapidly, they would just uh, choose a weekend and uh, just uh, free from any interruption and free from any other work to just concentrate on resolving those uh, many, as many tickets as possible. I was told that the marathon approach is also a very popular uh, video game playing strategy used by the engineer when they play games. Uh, actually, I, I list here, it's just an example. Uh, it's coming from my field notes. Describe uh, one engineer, Charles, who stayed up two nights straight in a, ro uh, in a row over the weekend, single-handedly resolved half of his team's legacy tickets, and then sent out an email to the entire org 1 a.m. Uh, on Monday to declare his uh, marathon victory. Uh, the final point I want to emphasize is that uh, the middle management support is very important. So one of the most uh, common uh, forms of support from the manager is the tacit understanding that the engineer can take it easy the day after the tickets marathon. For example, in the work where I did my field research, there is an unwritten rule. It is that whenever the engineer complete a ticket marathon, they will send an email to the team, just like uh, what Charles did, and uh, declare their achievement. At the same time, they will also send a request uh, of a work from home the next day. And uh, well, officially it's a work from home request, but in reality, the manager just uh, trying to allow the engineer to take the day off and uh, relax at home. And I won't talk about the comparison and I want just to wrap up the, 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 the research. So basically uh, through this book, I want to propose the idea of the field of games. And um, I used it as a conceptual hook for understanding the changing nature of labor control. And by conceptualize the field of game, this study shows that one single game apparently cannot satisfy the demand of a more complicated uh, labor process and uh, uh, lab uh, the demand of labor control. So instead, the study just uh, char uh, characterized uh, four uh, group of uh, 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 games. And it shows like each game has its own distinct uh, type of rules and embedded into different segments of the work process. And this study also trying to provide an analysis of the workers' gamer subjectivity in the labor game play. I illustrate through the game playing uh, informational capitalism incorporate uh, engineers of work gamer subjectivity into work and translate that into a productive one. And actually, I didn't talk about that, but in my book, I shows the alliance between the, the gamer subjectivity and the game setup decided the effectiveness of the game. And uh, this study also bring in the discussion of gamification technology and shows that gamification bring new dynamics to the labor study. Even so, those studies still not, uh, we cannot oversimplify it and uh, 
to see that completely effective or ineffective. Instead, I want to show like there are detailed conditions under which the gamification can work, other time cannot. And finally, the study trying to alert the readers that uh, uh, the, 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 the damaging uh, impact of the, the, the whole gamification or gamified work environment on employees' well-being and work-life balance and uh, collectiveness. So that's it. I'm so sorry for for extending the, the time. That's cool. Um, um, thank you very much. That was super duper interesting. I mean, a lot of stuff there. Um, Thanks. Thank you for that a lot. Um, I guess what I will do is pause for a second and then see if there's anyone who has anything that you'd like to ask about that because there's a lot covered yeah sorry look, looking at yeah so sorry just looking at the chat here so there was a few people who who who, who had to leave um Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Peter? Yep. Uh, I, I found it very interesting, especially as you, as you talked about that, what is really out, left out of these discussions. Uh, my question is, um, do you have any idea what this means for labor law? Because what it obviously shows that the, the traditional understanding of work, of uh, employment, doesn't work anymore and probably will not uh, work at any stage anymore if, if we take mm -hmm. part of, of the development. Um, at the same time, we need some kind of what we call it protection or uh, stabilization of the system. Can we do it within labor, within employment relationships, or can we do, do we have entirely different sociological societal uh, uh, outlines or structures there? What, what, would you have any idea on that? Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, so, like, which which project uh, you want me to elaborate on this issue, like the first one or the second one? Well, the the legal perspective in in well both the legal perspective and the employment uh, perspective usually works on this traditional pattern of um, having a full full time job for many years and being in employment. Uh, that's it. Uh, and then you have some security going hand in hand with it. Uh, right. if you see what what you talked about, uh, it's 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 not able to to maintain it. Um, question is is it would we or should we want to maintain it, or should we just uh, try to think about a different different uh, way of of uh, securing existence, not employment? Okay, sure. Uh, yeah, actually, um. I love that question. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, so, I mean, I'm quite uh, uh, actually pathetic about the whole, uh, the whole trend, especially because uh, I've been doing like the first, uh, the, the engineer uh, project for like five years uh, and then followed by another five years for the, 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 the AI industry annotation work. And uh, the most the radical uh, fundings I have is coming from the, the AI industry, especially like how they hire people uh, uh, from the platform. I didn't talk about that a lot, but uh, that is the one of the very scary uh, fundings of mine. Like, as I mentioned uh, during the, the talk, uh, when they kind of extended the supply chain, right? And uh, the basically the tech company just uh, don't care about like who are the workers who work for them to annotating data. And uh, what they called even uh, uh, during our interviews, uh, they called that they don't even believe in the concept of a labor force right now. What they believe in just the task force uh, meaning that they don't want to hire a full human body to perform a certain task. And uh, they will handle that by a rather radical understanding. It's like to just uh, divide the one task, let's see annotation, or let's see writing an essay, or let's see uh, uh, um, whatever, uh, into a uh, hundred pieces. 
and assign it on the platform and uh, to in the labor pool of uh, 10,000 people to compete for the 100 thesis and to uh, accomplish that within certain time they set up. And when I talk with the, the, the actually, that's actually one of the head of the engineering department. Uh, 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 he mentioned that actually coming from a, a, a quite precise engineering mentality. I don't know whether I can explain that well. The idea is that engineers only and always pay attention to how to scale up. So when they trying to design a task, they don't want to design that can just fix to finish the within one person. They want either to finish the for with one person or like finished and divided by 10,000 person so that they can finish in a more efficient way. And uh, I feel that's super scary. And I talk with the head, he is quite straightforward. And he's talking about like, under such a circumstance, he don't believe, he doesn't believe there is even a demand for any type of full-time uh, 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 employment in the future of the what what he called the digital society. And I also I also think that's why I keep thinking about the the relationship between the highly skilled group, the engineer, and the lower status uh, labor group like the platform workers. It's really interesting for me, like how the mentality from the engineer or the highly skilled workers can get or to engineer the whole platform environment and to shape the future employment relationship, but I haven't have any like definite conclusion for that point. I don't know whether I answer your question, but yeah, that's just mess up. Well, no, thanks. I think there's no definite answer anywhere on this question uh, yeah. because that's that's exactly what, what we have to think about as well in terms of development, uh, where we want to go. And yeah. If yeah. just maintain the traditions, or if we, we have to look for something different, right? Exactly. Well, and China is especially like to to develop anything in the most radical way. That's further to make me to increase my pathetic view about the whole issue. Well, if, if I may add something there, I, I read recently a study. I think it was from Stanford University. Um, which links a little bit the different, uh, as you mentioned, China and, and what we have in China and uh, compared, oh. it, like, it didn't really compare, but it, it uh, tried to draw attention on the developments uh, of AI in, uh, in the different parts of the world, and especially in the United States and, and China. Right. Uh, and there was a, a completely different, I think, a complete or rather different understanding of uh, what is AI used for. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was really in the in the um, in, in China more this uh, we we make work that can be uh, mm -hmm. done by robots and AI. Um, right. We we create space or we yeah we create space to for for higher levels of intellectual activities or whatever. Uh, where it, it it was in the United States really uh, get even the highest skills out of the way and replace employment by uh, everything that is possible in technical terms. I thought this was right. interesting in, in terms of the different use of it. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, that's, I don't, I, I should pay attention to this uh, Stanford research, but I totally agree. And uh, there's a completely different understanding between the US and uh, China in terms of AI development. So for the uh, for the US, at least uh, you can see debate around like uh, whether, how we should develop in the future, right? So the most famous debate is between the Sam Altman from OpenAI and the other. So Altman really want to commercialize all the products, but the other think about we need to be alert whether when we uh, uh, develop a super intelligent, will we give like some damaging to the uh, 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 the society, right? So there's a debate. But in China, I talk with a lot of company like Baidu, uh, TikTok, the beta dance, and uh, like Alibaba. So all the company reach agreement that we need to commercialize the, the, the AI, especially the large language model as soon as possible and making profit out of it. And how we can do that? <laughs> We copycat the U.S. technology. At the same time, we take advantage of the data because China is rich of all the data. So that's way. I mean, the tech companies think that's the strength 
of like China's AI industry. And uh, we need to use or maximally use those data uh, as soon as possible. That's why I start, start to study the data annotation industry because this is the most important industry to, to transform the, the uh, raw data into the, the, the data can fit into the machine. So, I, I mean, thank you so much. I need to, can you tell me more about the research from the uh, Stanford or any in information maybe? Well, I'm, I'm just looking up if I can find the study. Um, okay. Oops, uh -huh. uh, as I most likely won't find it, I, I will send it to Steve, uh, Stephen and he can pass it on because I don't great. have your contact directly, if you don't mind, Stephen. That would be great. Thank you so much. One thing I, I wanted to ask about, and this is going to be a little bit convoluted of, of a question. Uh -huh. um, I've been following debates around um, questions of intellectual property and, and uh -huh. AI tools. So, for instance, thinking here about um, our artists or writers who have objected to AI tools being trained on on, on their on their work, basically saying this is a uh, infringement on, on their intellectual property, right? Right. Now, the problem in making that kind of objection is the is the place where that infringement would actually occur it would be much earlier in the process in the data labeling phase, right? Yeah. Um, but one of the things you said, and I found quite interesting, is that if you're going to attempt to object to that happening, you talked about almost kind of like an opacity of the supply chain of data labeling. So people right. involved in it actually don't know what's happening in the various layers which in a lot of ways is kind of like the issues of supply chain opacity you have with all kinds of production, where if you're looking at sort of the production of trousers, the people who mm -hmm. are doing the actual production might not know who is you know, farming the cotton, right? Right. So I, I guess what I'm, what I'm wondering here is about when you have these different layers of, 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 of supply chain and data labeling and AI development, mm -hmm. whoa when you get sort of like legal conflicts that want to say something about this earlier stage, mm -hmm. how do you deal with that opacity of mm -hmm. the supply chain get, you know, or, 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 or does that just become a problem that you, that you can't deal with it? Cause it's, it's, yeah. it's sort of, you, you, you can't see through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, that's, that's a great question. I mean, I am aware of that uh, as well. And uh, I can, I can tell you, pretend like, oh, I mean, what the tech companies uh, have been telling me. And um, so basically it's it's actually uh, intuitive for us to suspect, right? Like what happened if there is some legal problem happening, how can we tracing back to the chain, right? Like to see where that went wrong. Actually, I, I talk about that question with uh, some of my interviewee through our conversation. What's really interesting, I feel like they that's their argument i will just paraphrase they're telling like i'm uh, making the wrong uh, uh assumption or like i'm a uh, worried in the wrong direction so they tell me the really uncontrollable part is not about the supply chain so it's not really what happened uh during the chain like uh will produce some sort of um uh uh uh, uh false intellectual property, <laughs> they will call that, okay? But the things like they felt the most scared of is like the, the uncontrollable phenomenon coming from the machine. So what they call is the self-emerge. So basically that indeed a black box and I have a lot of uh, like uh, uh, examples. They talk, uh, they talk about how they just uh, tracing all the chain, getting all the data and putting into the machine. And it's the output coming out of uh, a very like completely unimaginable, scary, like knowledge, what they call the knowledge or like value. So I don't know that whether that answer your question, but that's the first reaction because we have exactly the same like conversation about like property, right? Like the 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 whole information flowing during a supply chain. And when I talk with the 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 industry, that's their like reaction. <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, to give you give you a different example, um, um, a, a powerful mm -hmm. meme this week has been people coming up with um, quite bizarre results generated by AI infused uh, on Google searches, right, and, and on, on the uh -huh. searches that are giving you completely right. insane, incorrect information. 
Um, yeah. Now, I, I I suspect that would happen. That 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 outcome is caused by an earlier labeling issue, right? Mm -hmm. But when you get an an AI tool which gives you, let's say, mm -hmm. or possibly dangerous information, mm -hmm. where does legal responsibility lie for that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that that's that maybe that that's one of those sort of mysterious unknown emergencies you're talking about, and that could be yeah. So yeah, that could be definitely an issue. Oh no, no, but but if if that's the case, I I do have like another like a more straightforward answer for that. It will be the alignment uh department. So mm. they have a like a policy within the uh, uh, Chinese high tech industry. It's called the source management. So they don't want to trace back to any like third, fourth tier of the supplier. So whatever something happened, they just trace back to two organizations. One is the, the annotation base and the other is the alignment department. They just go through the interaction between those two departments. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Paul? Hi there. Yeah, um, I, I really appreciate your talk. Thank you very much. You've raised uh, so many important issues here. My research is um, a little bit um, not quite in the AI space, but I very much appreciate this discussion of supply chains. Um, uh -huh. And I guess I had a bit, of, I, I agree with uh, Stefan's question a moment ago, where does the legal responsibility happen? I just imagine that if IKEA gave uh -huh. me a table and one of the legs, I don't know, had a sharp spike in it and it hit my kid or, you know, something went wrong. There are audit processes. There are whole NGO initiatives to make this better, to trace the supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering I'm wondering how that is in the China side. I know in the US we do have NGOs. We do have people speaking out, as you mentioned mm -hmm. before, about the debates that are going on. Is there that kind of response also in China, putting pressure on the companies to kind of, maybe audit themselves self-regulate or even have formal regulation um mm. that would be that would be my first question is there that civil society pressure and how how do you see that from the interviews that you had and a follow-up question is do you have the same kind of um tech tech bro culture for a better word you know that tech bros mm. can't be wrong and the singularity is coming and get on board or you know, don't look at the supply chain, just look at a great product. Is that the same also? I just found it really interesting what you're sharing about the experience coming out of the companies um, in China. Uh -huh. uh, well, let me answer the first question for uh, uh, first. Uh, so that's really interesting uh, about like, who to take account on, right? To what if like something happened? I'm pretty sure, 90% uh, sure it won't, uh, relied on the civil society for sure but what's really interesting from my like uh, latest uh, field trip the from last year i found uh, it's actually the government the central government become the most cautious about mm -hmm. like what if something wrong so because like i i mean i know it's a recording i don't know whether it's okay to to talk about that um so like the government is super cautious about the large language model recently, uh, just like what Steve said uh, and everybody, it's like they believe when we search on something and if like uh, the result popped up on the website, it's coming from the large language model, right? It's what gave us a direction. That direction for the government is called the uh, 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 um, value di direction. They really, uh, they're really scared of like, um, what if the large language model, the output is not language, it's knowledge, it's the value, it's the ideology. So what happened? So the government actually have already set up a lot of policies to check each point of the chain to make sure like, that's the uh, ironic part. They want to make sure, they want to regulate, but just like what I said, and also the tech corporations said like, it's actually you cannot something just pop out out outside the black box and the, the the tech company will just pay the penalty and to have to shoulder the responsibility but they don't even know how to fix that but the government's still trying to but it's still in the process they're trying to i'm doing more research uh uh with the chinese official but it's super difficult to to learn more like how they trying to 
I don't I don't want to say they are performing the civil society uh, responsibility, but they are doing that uh, uh, in a really ironically similar way to check each point of the supply chain. And the second question, I mean, can I check one more time? I don't quite understand about the tech bro part. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I follow some online social media of mm -hmm. some of these kind of polemicists, you know. Um, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a couple of researchers in the US who keep having this fight. There's Elon Musk. There's all these people saying, you know, that tech technology is going to fix everything, and AI is the current the current mm -hmm. flavor of of talking about that. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. if there are groups or writers in the China in China Chinese experience who are kind of polemicists who are also saying, you know, technology is going to fix all our problems. The singularity is coming where technology would control oh. everything. And that's a great thing. And if you don't like mm -hmm. it, you're being depressing and you're a Luddite and all of this stuff. Does that make sense? I'm just wondering yeah, yeah, if yeah, yeah, yeah. similar yeah, yeah, yeah. happening in East Asia as well. Yeah. I mean, that's a quite, it's interesting. It's the last part of the youth culture in China. So like there is a lot of like, uh, fictional novelist and the readers trying to so there's a, like a culture called the lay down culture in China so it's people people doing nothing right just the just uh, to enjoy the life because like, what's the point? And uh, it's really interesting. I actually joined one of the group, the Facebook group and the Chinese uh, uh, grassroots group to discuss about that. It's reinforced the lay down culture. It's because like they believe in the singularity and they believe like at some point, part of the conversation also about the, the self emerge, right? Like what if the AI self emerge uh, intelligence, right? Then all the human will leave the control to the, the 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 machine and then like we can do nothing about that they are just the, what i found really interesting to use that discord to discourse to 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 reinforce their lay down culture because like originally the lay down culture uh well at least from the article some articles i read about it's more like a protest of the youth generation for the government, right? They believe the pressure is too much in China right now. They don't want to do something. But when they intertwined with the technological bro culture, it's come become like really interesting. And um, but I do also uh hear a lot of critiques uh for those tech type of uh, like a singularity culture and they believe that belongs to actually that's the part of maybe draw my attention because of my previous research they believe that belongs to the programming culture back to the u.s programming culture means like a bro the combination between bro and programming and they believe like this is the group dominated the discourse elon musk is a one of the, the <laughs> like the the symbol of the programming culture and uh, they are cautious about like we cannot let the programming discourse coming from the U.S. to dominate the Chinese culture. There is much different. We need to like cautious about that. So I I do I do pay attention to like debates around that uh, issue. Thanks so much for pointing that out. Yeah, it's super interesting how it develops in different ways, but there's some similarities like the youth culture, and we also have Bitcoin being attached to that culture here. So super yeah, interesting yeah, yeah. to hear you talk about that. Thank you. Right. Cool. Are there any other other questions, or 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 or, or should we thank Tong Tong Yu and and go have lunch? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's time for you guys to have lunch for sure. <laughs> Sorry for like the beginning of the technical issue. I don't know why every time when I talk about technology stuff, there are technical issue happen. I I don't think it would be a real academic event if there was wasn't at least one tech failure. That's kind of like part. <laughs> It just goes, <laughs> goes with the with, with this with the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well okay. in that case, thank you very much for coming along. That was thank super you so interesting. much for inviting gonna... me. Doop. <laughs>